This is Duke University. I'd like to take a moment again to congratulate the graduate students who have pulled this together. So glad to think about the afterlife of these events, so they all will be living online at some point, uh, so other folks who weren't able to be here can also uh, partake in some ways in the experience. So I had the pleasure to do a kind of quick introduction uh, to the two gentlemen behind me. Um, and I'll start about 22 years ago um, at a conference at NYU called the Soul Conference. Um, I was a young graduate student um, and in a room that also included Amiri Baraka, Ishmael Reed, Trisha Rose, and a whole bunch of other important Negroes. <laughs> um, this is at a moment where the American Studies and Africana Studies program at NYU was popping with folks like Trisha and Monthea Diawara and Robin D.G. Kelly and all these kinds of folks. And you had access to these incredible black thinkers in places like the Village Voice. Um, so it was a very unique moment. And it's the first time I heard Arthur, AJ. Um, I had been following Greg for a long time. You know, uh, my man, uh, uh, damn, why can't I remember your name? No. <laughs> Talked earlier about Ta-Nehisi Coates. Um, Greg Tate was my ta Coates, to put that in some sort of perspective. Reading him in The Village Voice in the 1980s, incorporating some of his stylistic tendencies. Of course, if you know AJ's work, you know it from the cinematography that he did for Daughters of the Dust. Um, you also know for the cinematography that he did for Spike Lee films like Crooklyn. Um, and of course, we're here celebrating what are their new works. In the case of Greg, this is uh, Flyboy 2, which is just published by Duke University <laughs> Press. The original Flyboy, which I bought in Toronto in the summer of 1992 with my first Bell Hooks book. Um, and, and felt as though I was doing something disruptive at the time. Uh, and of course, we're going to get the chance to see uh, AJ's new project, Love is the Message and the Message is Death, uh, which is in part a homage to that great MFSB song, Love is the Message. So we're going to screen that, um, and then we'll just jump in. And see what you should know about these two, um, as they will tell you, they met each other in front of Howard University's library more than 30 years ago, started a conversation, and they have been continuing that same conversation since that first meeting on, on HU's campus. So we'll take a moment and see the film, um, and then we'll get into this. Um, AJ? Damn. <laughs> um, you know, to give you just a little bit of context, at least as it relates to Duke, um, about eight years ago, uh, AJ and Greg came down, and, and one of the things they, they showed in their conversation um, was a, a video treatment for Imani Yuzuru's uh, song, um, which was done by Pierre Benu, right? And, and it brought together this kind of interesting use of mixed media in conversation. It's an earlier moment in YouTube, um, and Pierre had a whole kind of dynamic about having to make it available as fair use and, and some of that. In some ways, I feel as though what I just saw is a, is a response um, amped you know, to, to what Pierre did you know, some eight or nine years ago. Um, AJ, you want to talk about what you were trying to capture there? Because um, I'm just looking at a range of people in the audience. Um, and just from my own, my own reaction, again, to go back to the title, you know, um, you know, love is a message and the message is death and, and the wild emotions that you go back and forth between these, these moments of celebration which get brought back down to ground with the, with the gravity uh, of the trauma and the death and everything else that we kind of face on a regular basis. So if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what you were trying to capture, AJ. Well, you know, I've been told already that I'm not the best person to talk about uh, <laughs> you know, work, what it means, yeah, or anything like that. Um, I kind of, I kind of tend to want to stay in the process space because that's the part I feel like I have a more of a handle on. Uh, I mean, it's my oft-repeated mantra 
It's a mantra at this point. I almost feel like I need to have it on a neon sign flash behind my head. I've said it so many times. But, uh, you know, our goal and our objective is to make black cinema with the power, beauty, and alienation of black music. And that's it, like in a nutshell. Um, and I, it's something that I've actively thought about and uh, pursued and worked on for like 30 years now, I guess. And uh, in some ways, um, uh, not too much the technology caught up, but the access to technology sort of caught up in a certain respect uh, with ideas that I've had and developed for a long time. I mean, even as far back as, well, even before the orders, actually, because even in the early uh, 80s, like in 82, I think, 81, 82, I made a piece called Considerations that in many ways does almost a large part of all the things that I wanted to do, but I just didn't really know what to do with it at the time. I mean, it was like prior to internet. I wasn't really trying to be an experimental filmmaker per se. It didn't seem to make sense in relationship to anything anybody around me was making. I mean, my sort of circle filmmakers, you know, would have been like Reggie Hubbard and Spike. And I mean, that's the group I guess I came up with. Um, but it was very different from anything anybody else was uh, even aspiring to do, I think. And uh, and I just sort of sat on it. I think I kind of put it in the closet to a certain degree. And uh, I've kind of come to realize, some I've said, I think it's true to a large degree. I mean, to quibble about it. But uh, I was like, my career went forward, but my practice went backwards in a way. Um, in the sense that when I did Daughters, I'm very proud of Daughters and all that, my involvement with it. But it, it definitely was a kind of acquiescing to a certain kind of uh, normative notion of what a movie is supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be like. I mean, I haven't said that. You know, I did what I could do. It wasn't like, I'm not, I'm not, it's, not it's not like I'm trying to say I have any ambivalence about it or anything. It's just that it, it, it really was like, it was like being in the jazz band and then joining you know, orchestra or something like, I mean, a black orchestra, but an orchestra never less. Um, um, and, but you know, but even as far back as then, I had already formulated some of the basic, like technical ideas, which have been things like black visual intonation and stuff. And we even tried to implement some of it on Daughters, um, less so on Crooklyn, even though I tried to do it on Crooklyn. And then I just, I think I went into a bit of a kind of, I don't know, bio-narrative, whatever, but kind of a tailspin in a certain respect because I just didn't really figure out what to do with, you know, the ideas that I had and stuff. But, uh, and then I basically kind of retired. <laughs> you know, I just sort of said, I'm retired from film. I'm not fucking with film no more. And for about six years, I didn't really work on film at all. I basically kind of um, pursued an art career, a fine arts career. Uh, and I had some success, uh, quite a bit, I think. And then I got disenchanted with that. And I ran into a really, really close friend of mine. It's like, a, one, like my closest, like film associate, Malik uh, Saeed, Hassan Saeed, who, you know, sort of famous. He shot a number of Spikes films. He shot Clockers. He got games. He shot Bailey for, for, uh, with Hype Williams. He just done a lot of stuff, and he's been a successful, like, commercial director. Well, anyway, I just ran into Malik in the streets, and we were talking, and he just said something like, yo, man, it's really a shame you're not really in the film thing anymore. You know, it's just like, it's kind of hard for me to process it. And this was right around time, like, digital cameras were starting to come online and stuff. So we were just started hanging out. He had just moved back to New York from L.A., and we just started talking and hanging out, and just slowly but surely, I basically sort of migrated back to film, such as it is, and we started a film company, Teenage whose uh, explicit purpose was to, like I said, you know, power be the alienation of the black moon. So we just, we sort of acted, we did a thing called The Shot, which was our first little, what we call it, proof of concept project. We're trying to demonstrate some of the things, because a lot of what we were doing is just trying to think through, well, what would a black cinema look like? You know, when I started at Howard, I was actually started architecture at Howard and drifted into the film department. And, um, you know, I just stumbled into like the epicenter of black independent film thought, um, aesthetics and stuff, because Hailey Greenman was there. I don't know, Hailey, was he like three or four years out of UCLA at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that more than three, four years out of UCLA, so-called UCLA rebellion. 
which would have been Charles Burnett, Hyla Green, and Larry Clark, and then the filmmakers came after them, Julie Dad, Bob McCullough, McCullough Lee Lace, Ben Caldwell, a bunch of incredible filmmakers. And in a way, it's the first time in the history of uh, cinema, black cinema, cinema, that you had a group of filmmakers who were not just operating from maybe from certain um, resources, but were consciously attempting to sort of actualize what we might term a black cinema. Uh, so Hiley really came into Howard very much with that sort of ethos at the center of like the pedagogy, I guess you are saying that he was trying to implement. And so we were confronted like from day one with this idea of like, we gotta you know, make black cinema. And so then that leads to the question, well, what is black cinema? And then it, it, it goes down a complicated path where, you know, you adopt certain definitions until they're no longer useful, and then you come up with better definitions, and then you use those until they're no longer used. And the first definition was like, black cinema is cinema with black people in front of the camera. <laughs> That's not super useful, beyond a point. Uh, you know, because uh, even like most of the black exploitation films were directed by white directors and written by white directors. Doesn't mean it can't be black cinema if it's written by a white director, but the definition, and this is why I sort of gravitate towards the music thing as a point of reference. You know, it's like, I always, it's an oldest analogy, I always say like, if you know Leotine Price or Jesse Norman, they're great at what they do. Maybe even geniuses at what they do, and maybe if you know opera well enough, you could even argue that they bring a black sensibility to what they do. But that form, opera, developed over hundreds of years in response to a certain set of culturally, socially dictated, expressive desires. I mean, it evolved to articulate those things, you know, the things that the people existentially were experiencing. You know, it's very different from Aretha Franklin or Al Green, somebody like that, because when you hear them singing, you're not just hearing their individual genius um, expressing itself, you're hearing them operate and contribute to a form that developed and evolved in response to the circumstances that black people found themselves in. So to me, it seemed like the black cinema that I imagined that I think that we deserve in some ways um, demanded that same kind of complex relationship to who we are culturally, existentially, politically, socially, spiritually, all this kind of thing. And it can't simply be, if you put black people in front of the camera, that makes it black cinema, because we know niggas do anything for money. Uh, and it can't simply be, you put black people behind the camera, because as I said, niggas do anything for money. Uh, you know, so it really had to be not just black people you know, occupying whatever critical positions, but it's like what they do when they're in those positions. Because uh, many instances, people might even have, they might, you know, be in the right frame of mind or spirit, but the context itself won't even allow certain kinds of things. So, you know, in the beginning it was like, it's not Hollywood. Okay, great, it's not Hollywood. That was a very radical notion when I first heard it, because I was like, what's not, not Hollywood? You know, that's before I didn't even know anything about foreign films or anything like that. And, uh, you know, that's good up to a point, but then it, it puts you in a binary opposition with Hollywood, which is, you know, to the degree that it frees you up, it also limits you, like constrains you. So if Hollywood is narrative, does that mean black film is non-narrative? If Hollywood is in color, does it mean black film is in black and white? I mean, this shit sounds kind of absurd now, but at the time, people were seriously struggling with this. It was like, if you make a film in color, you're a bourgeoisie, and if you make it in black and white, you're revolutionary. It sounds stupid now, but... At the time, it wasn't, you know, because people were really trying to get a handle on what the thing was supposed to uh, look like, or as I would say, feel like, how it was supposed to behave. So. How you flex oppositionality. Yeah, in exactly. The medium, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, you know, I can go on and on about this shit for ages and ages. <laughs> but, uh, uh, basically, I just feel like I should sort of get to a point now where I'm in a position to implement some things, you know, and so. I guess I'm very big on proof of concept. Uh, this piece sort of made its own way in the world. I certainly didn't see it as anything but a kind of proof of concept. It was something I was just messing around with. I didn't have an agenda when I put it together. It wasn't like, oh, let me capture where black people had anything like that. So anything I might say about what it means is really like post-rationalizing it. I mean, I just kind of put it together. 85% of it I put together in about two hours. And then I fiddled with it for about a month after that, but pretty much, the main components of it went fell together very, very quickly.
And now keep in mind, this has been part of an exhibition in New York for the last two weeks that just closed. Two months. Two months that, that's just closed. Um, so, you know, taking into consideration the opportunity that has been here to see this now. Um, but Greg, given what, what AJ just said about the filmmaking process, you know, what does that look like in terms of the work of criticism? Um, and, uh, you know, how many of you are on Facebook or, or follow um, Greg on Facebook, you know, there are a lot of folks on Facebook that post 27 times a day um, and, and the same 27 things they posted the day before. Um, you rarely get brilliant insight <laughs> conveyed within that medium. And, you know, Greg will very often describe himself as a reporter. Um, and, and what you get in this truncated space um, it is a, a real kind of economical exegesis, if you will, of, of critical insight. Um, and it seems as though you've been doing that throughout your career, whether it's been at The Voice or whether that is book length, um, or whether that in this case is Facebook post. Um, are you kind of driven by those same things or, or what are you driven by You know, when you decide to put your critical eye to something and share it to a broader public? Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna deviate slightly before I answer your question because um, I've actually seen this piece probably about 50 times now in various iterations on probably every kind of personal device. But anytime I've, I've seen it or shown it with an audience, I always feel like um, um, there's this moment uh, that the audience should have been allowed, <laughs> allowed to exhale the piece, you know what I mean? Um, and the thing about seeing it, you know, Jay will tell you he's dead inside when he watches the piece now, but I get messed up like in all the same places every every time. So um, to slightly break with the format, yeah. if I could, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm always curious about people's immediate responses and even if if it's if they even feel it's something they're ready to be. Uh, 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 Kind of render intelligible or can I can articulate? But I'm just curious because you are, I'm assuming mostly like a first time audience. Yeah, just um, uh, just how uh, as Charles Mingus would say, uh, you know, how did it hit you in your soul? You know, so so I'm kind of I'm I'm opening up the the floor early and then. We, <laughs> that was so academic, wasn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, that was considered one of my first reaction. And yeah. then kind of thinking about how we try to force ourselves to see these moments of joy through pain. I think it was just listening to the ultra being to go with it. Really just put me in a place that the tears just freely fell. Um, and kind of thinking about you know how just to make ourselves known, to make our agency known, whether that agency is respectable. Or not, right? Whether you do a slow drag or you get your freak on at a party in the basement. I mean, like all of that, the range of black humanity that was shown. It wasn't just this is respectable to look at, this is what the stuff. I mean, like, I think that was the brilliance of it, is showing that we're complex folks and you can't outdo us in anything. Um, and that was just, you know, this is actually my second time saying that about that black spot. No. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw it, I had to cry because I didn't know what was happening. Um, but this time I was like, I felt joy in watching it. And, and I feel like I don't want to come back to nothing but I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. like, it's brilliant and it's beautiful. And I think there is a challenge in these trying times to be committed to seeing joy through it all. Um, it's a conscious and intentional um, practice. And so for me, this time, the second time seeing it, I very much reminded me. For me, the uh, moment where tears came was the Olympic moment. But then I was immediately taken to, and that was the whole experience for me, was the immediacy of being moved through emotional connection, celebration, excitement, immersion, gaze. So it was a whole lot all at one time coming, but at the end of it, 
And just like Mark said, maybe an opportunity to say, ah, oh. <laughs> in there somewhere might have been cool. But at the end of it, you know, I was like, okay, yes, this is a, this is this is this is all of us. This is where we all are. I, it begged the question for me as to whether or not there was a soundtrack or not. But the, the visual immersion was 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 an adventure and a conscious raising. Yeah, I feel really it's really The redemption of Kanye West. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I call it. Speaking of that, that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah. Kanye. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the conference started Thursday night with a screening of Black is Black Ain't. Um, and, you know, the, there's a lot in terms of the content of that film that makes it such a great film, but there's a moment in that film where Bell Hooks is in this conversation with Louis Farrakhan. She's telling the story of her father removing her mother from the home, and then Louis Farrakhan is telling this story, of, uh, basically validating um, Mike Tyson's rape of, of Desiree Washington. And what I'm reminded about in that clip is the genius of Marlon Riggs' editing there where he could create a kind of moment where the two of them are in conversation. And, and that raises questions about when we just think about being a filmmaker or just think about being a writer or a musician or a visual artist that the platforms themselves actually limit the full exploration of our genius. Well, I was going to... I guess um, uh, I think there were a couple other people that wanted to 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 to, to respond. Yeah, to yeah. I need you too. Right? Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you for opening this space. Like the function that you talk to the screen, we talk back. Speech is emotional because it doesn't allow that. It's like close black performance, and you know, and that space to exhale. We we need that. We need to be able to sing along, to resist it, to shout out. And the, the piece, you know, this piece in this context wants to say that something else matters too. And that's part of what makes it uh, very difficult um, in terms of the space where do we enter the work that's not about putting us just into ourselves, but putting us back into community. So the opportunity you get a restaurant to talk about it um, is definitely a part of how we can recognize its blackness as performance or its blackness. Appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just a short comment, but I, I think uh, something I'm always cognizant of when watching the film is if I feel recognized as the viewer of the film, and I think what was so powerful about this is that it felt very clear. I felt um, very clearly spoken to, very clearly seen and recognized as a viewer. And so there's a lot of a film that explores all you know all kinds of aspects of um, black history and culture and so on, but I don't feel like it's talking to me or looking at me or really trying to communicate something to me. But this was so powerfully directed toward you know um, I, I just kind of felt um, you know there was a rare experience of feeling um, visible as. I was really moved by the family uh, album dimension of it. Mm -hmm. That we're looking at people we know, both historical people and recent people that we've seen on YouTube. So, so there's almost a kind of a common collective uh, imaging. But the, the two things that struck me that, that, that colored that was one, um, the images of ecstasy. There's several moments where people are falling out are, are just kind of, they are filled with something. And it's both, sometimes it's, it's church, sometimes it's, it, it's, it's, sec, it's secular, and, um, and, and it just kind of, and, and one wants to kind of almost put themselves in those, those bodies. The other part of this was the, were the monsters, you know, the aliens. And I think what really was kind of moving for me was that that was part of our family. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I've, I've been wanting to, 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 as I said, like be in a room where it's screened for folks and folks kind of got to share, you know, uh, have that, that immediate moment. But in relationship to some of the things that have come up earlier in the in the conference, have just been kind of buzzing around uh, my head or today, you know. Um, there was a conversation earlier about, um, you know, black studies having to, to transform and, and to be morphed in a way that accommodated um, the, the, the ways, the extra academic ways in which the culture wanted to speak through the discipline, you know, and um, which, you know, just led me to um, uh, the, the notion that, um, yeah, well, yeah. Black studies is, is is always trying to is trying to evolve more 
more, it's trying to evolve into church. You know, it's, it's, it's essentially within the space become more and more like a church space. But the thing that I also think about is that, um, and it's in reference to this piece too, is that I knew it was going to be a different experience seeing it in the South as opposed to in New York um, because black studies in the South is already church for me relative to uh, the experience of teaching it and going to conferences on it in, you know, um, in, in the North, because in the North it's Africana studies. It's like black, <laughs> black studies has, has, has been, uh, you know, um, surgically removed, you know. And, and I mean in some really, you know, some, some really notable, peculiar ways, like, you know, I, I did, um, you know, five years at Brown, a couple years at Yale Graduate Art School, uh, you know, mostly black students, and with, um, and you know, did this fellowship at at, uh, at Williams, you know, and uh, one of the things I I decided I had to do, no matter what the topic of the class was, is like, um, you've been misserved by your education in these institutions if you have not read Blues People, if you do not know right. Blues People exist, right? You know, so you know, and that, and it's just interesting to think about a department calling itself Africana Studies. And Amiri Baraka is not automatically in the, the top five books you must read to get a degree at this institution. You know what I mean? So, um, so I mean, that, you know, and that's just that's just one part. Of it. But I, but you know, I was also conscious of like the spectatorship aspect of what you were talking about the antiphonal the call and response, you know, church aspect. It was like I knew um, even with all the screenings. That, that you know we had been in and I've been in individually that um I said this was gonna be the one where they're gonna be the most people who know who all these athletes are. And, you know, remember the it actually um you know have seen, you know, uh might actually witness those moments when they when they actually occur, you know, in the culture. So that, you know, there's this whole notion of, you know, black studies is cultural conver conversation, you know, that's that and as conversation that also can have uh, a deeply emotional uh, component, you know, aspect to it as well, you know. Um, and so when, um, but I was also, you know, one of the things that, you know, when uh, Regina's talking, we're having a conversation about, you know, uh, T.I. and, you know, his, his capacity to be you know, CEO, and then, you know, trap man. It's like, that's a hustler. You know what I mean? Or that's like in Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man is a great passage of where the protagonist discovers that uh, this character he's been calling Reinhardt is like five or six different people in the community. You know what I mean? He's like, Ryan the runner, and Ryan the rambler, and Ryan the lover, and Ryan the hustler, and Ryan the preacher, you know. And he said, uh, and he goes on to say that, uh, he said, he said, he was light years ahead of me. I had been a fool. He lived in a world of hot seething possibility, you know, and I relate that to something, you know, AJ uh, generally talks about, uh, you know, uh, but in relationship to this piece and his choices, which is, uh, you know, linear thinking is, will be the death of us, you know, and uh, he's, and, you know, like, um, uh, We it's like we don't have time for him to, to really do something, you know. And I know he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to do it, but you know, because uh, but he does this micro reading of the piece where he actually goes through each segment, you know what I mean? And it's like, and it gets and it gets down to, you know, just micro things in the edits. Like we could actually talk through it quick, you know, in a quick kind of way, you know. But um, but in around just that old question of like, you know. Uh, how you compartmentalize, you know, your identity within the culture, you know. Um, you also, you're also speaking to the complexity that everybody talks about in terms of, uh, well, if you're trying to image black culture, like all of that, it has to be, <laughs> has to be in there. You know what I mean? That's like, it's why you would say you feel recognized in there because um, it's it's such a. a uh, I won't say complete, but it's a broad swath, 
you know. And I know that uh, it's funny. It's funny. I mean, I can tell my man is just kind of. No, like I'm, holding, but you know, I'm holding my tongue. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I know you. Um, you know, I mean, but he, you know, he, he's, he's had, you know, well, you can talk about just responses you've gotten from, you know, queer community um, around the piece, you know, um, where people are actually surprised, you know, that that image yeah. is there. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. So, but what I, the, my point, and I'll just turn it back over to him again, is that um, when I looked at it this time, I, you know, I just thought about how, well. You, the only way you can reconcile that um, uh, that range and um, of representations is with love. You know what I mean? Um, like, so when I looked at it this time, you know, um, like if I got emotional, it was like, oh, my boy loves him some black people. <laughs> <laughs> you know? All of, all of us, soup to nuts, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's a lot I can say, but uh, I'm gonna. Um, I did take a couple of notes. That's when people said things. I just wanted to kind of super kind of just respond to it. Uh, uh, one thing I wrote here is I say, if we have a superpower, it's our ability to be able to see beauty anywhere, even in this hellhole. Um, I mean, it's a thing you do actively. It's a verb. It's not like, you know, it's the beauty is denied at the holder, but it's like taking it to a whole, whole other level. I mean, claim it. Because if we can't do that, we can't see ourselves as beautiful because everything about this tells us we're not. So we have to, that's an active thing. It's a muscle. Um, I'm a, I had a reading done about, yeah, my son's born. So maybe about eight or nine years ago. Uh, Danny Dawson, who's a, a lot of people know Danny Dawson, but in addition to him being an all around, you know, a hero champion of the culture, he's, uh, he's also a, a, an adept in what, Yoruba? Yoruba, Yoruba yeah. yeah. And he sort of sent me to talk to somebody, um, you know, because I was just trying to figure out what I was doing. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm kind of wobbling a little bit. And uh, he sent me to this young brother, it turned out to be. I, mean, I was surprised. It was like, you got to go here, and this housing project. And I'm going thinking I'm going to see some stereotypical, you know what I mean? Like, you know, ancient one. <laughs> the Oracle. The Oracle, exactly. It's like 23 year old brother. You know, I was like, what? And, uh, and uh, Danny said, yeah, I sent you to him in particular because he's, uh, you know, he comes from a long line of people like that. He's been identified as a person and it's not like an age thing. It's just like and his and his readings are would be considered somewhat radical readings. So I think you and him would be a good fit, right? And the first thing he told me, he said, You're a specialist. He said you're a specialist and you come from a long line of specialists. And uh and I have actually worked um consciously to get a full understanding of what I think he was trying to tell me. And, uh, and I think I have a grasp on it now to a certain degree. I mean, there's certain things by myself that I've come to accept. Uh, I, I like to say I'm an undertaker. Uh, and I mean that in the larger sense of it, um, almost in the commercial or Egyptian sense of it. Um, I think, uh, you know, like uh, once when I was at Howard, this um, brother came. He was showing this film. I can't even remember the name of the film, but got into a conversation with him. He said, you know the myth of the griot? I was like, I know what a griot is. He's like, no, do you know where griots came from? Nah. He said, well, basically, the origin of the griot goes like this. There was two brothers. They were taking this long voyage. It was like an epic, Ulyssian, you know, like Ulysses Odyssey. Odyssey. It was a quest. They took this long voyage. And there's a lot of stories that come in that voyage. But basically, towards the end of it, after years of being away from the village, they were getting close to returning home. But, you know, their travels had, uh, they seen amazing things, but it had taken its toll. And one of the brothers was basically so weak, he just had come to the conclusion he wasn't going to be able to make it back home. So he told his brother, he said, uh, Yo, man, I need to just take a rest here. They're on the road, right? I need to take a rest here. And uh, you, uh, you just going forward. I'm just going to catch my brother and I catch up with you. Okay, cool. 
Brother walked away. Brother laid down on the side of the road just to die. Didn't want to hold his brother up, right? His brother knew something was wrong, stopped, came back, and saw his brother laying on the side of the road and said, ah, so he realized what was happening. So what he did, he stopped, he took his knife out and cut his calf off. And he cooked it on the side of the road. And then he came back to his brother and woke him up. He said, look, man, I found some food. You should eat. So his brother ate, ate the food, regained his strength. They stood up, they walked on, they got back to the village. Everybody was so excited to see them. They had been gone for so long. So people cheered. And then in that same instance, people realized what had happened. So they ran away in horror. They realized my man had eaten his own blood, brother's flesh. And, uh, and so the brother who had eaten his brother's flesh realized what had happened. And he said, look, from this moment onward, me and my sons and my daughters will sing the praises of you and your sons and your daughters. And then their sons and their daughters are going to sing the praises of their sons and their daughters. So he said, the moral of the story is, he said, in the traditional context, when griots die, even though they are central components of the community, I mean, they are the ones who retain the history so that people can understand the complexity of who they are. But when they die, they don't bury them with everybody else. They put them in trees and let the maggots eat them, right? He said, because at the end of the day, even though they are essential for the survival of the community, they feed on the flesh of the people. Uh, he said, so, <laughs> if people look at you funny, you just have to accept that as part of your role. You have to accept that. You have to get used to that. You have to be prepared to be the people you love are going to look at you funny. Because when some shit goes down and everybody's all hands on, you're going to be standing there taking notes. Okay. I've been like that since I was a kid. I would pitch in, but I was always the weirder the shit got, the cooler I got. <laughs> And I grew, up in, I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, so I've seen a lot of weird ass shit. <laughs> um, like, truly, I'm not exaggerating. I could talk for five hours about weird ass shit I've seen. But, Look greasy, uh, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, so many things. <laughs> so bizarre. Uh, anyway. Um, anyway, he just saying, look, so when you feel alienated from the people you love, that's your burden to bear because... That's necessary. Like Greg was saying, he's alluded to something that I've said almost every time I've spoken with this piece. Is when I look at it, I don't feel anything, nothing. The first time I put it together, the footage of the sister backing up, the footage of the brother who was running, his father came to help him. That's footage that if I had thought about it for years, I would cry. If I just thought about it, it's really the most moving thing I've ever seen on TV in my life. When I, I saw it in real time when it happened, and it fucked me up. Just a simple thing. I had never seen a black man support his, his son, his child like that. I had never seen any rendering of it anywhere. Not in books, not in comic books, not in movies, nowhere. I'd never seen anything like it. And we're not talking about even like a black man and his baby boy. We're talking about a grown ass man. That brother was the fastest man in the world in that event for three straight years. He got to the Olympics. It was in the semifinals. He pulled a hamstring. It was over. And it was just such an incredible moment. Like, you're looking at it in real time, you're going like, oh, man, like that. And all of a sudden, the camera started weaving around and something trying to figure out what's happening. And somebody's coming out of the stands, and you don't know what it is. You don't know if it's somebody trying to attack him. Or, and the Olympic officials, all they all sort of collapsed on this brother. And he was like, I would say it was like some Kung Fu shit. He did some shit like that. And I'm like, oh, I'm I swear, I'll never forget it. It's like, and you couldn't hear, and you, you know. And like you, Dynamite. Yeah, exactly. Like Dynamite. You couldn't, you couldn't really hear what he was saying, but you knew what he was saying. Get the fuck off me. This is my son. And he ran over to him. And the, you could see the fish that had the green coats on. They're looking around like, what's going on? My man just went over to his son. His son was trying to hold it together when he saw what he Because when his father first comes to it, if you look at it, he, he, he's, actually, he's actually trying to push his father off and he realizes it's his father. And then at that moment, you can just see he really let's go, man. He just started crying. Because that was like, that, the injury, he had an ACL injury. That's the kind of injury when they have it in basketball, they lay down on the floor and cry, like for real. And he's trying to limp. And his father, real time, they just limped to the finish line. It's like the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, but when I, start, when I put it together, like I said, I put it together very quickly. 
I remember literally sitting at, at this editing rig right here, crying. And after that, I never felt anything again. I do not feel anything. When I see it, I look at it, I feel like a plumber. It's just, it's, is that flowing right? Is that flowing right? Is that flowing right? When, when I saw it, I feel a little now because I'm feeling y'all feeling it. And I noticed that once before, like at uh, Gavin's place, I would say it was like, I was standing in a room full of people and they were having an experience and I was sort of drafting off of it. You know, so I think it's something related to, like they say, surgeons and operating on their own families or something. It's something like that. It's just like, I think, it's like volatile material. Trigger. Yeah, it's like you have to, you got to, you got to be somewhat clinical about it, you know, I think. I don't know. That's my thing. I throw that out to people because I'm certain of I, I almost, even though it sounds like I got this pat understanding of it, um, it's been very, very disturbing to stand in front of it and stand in a room with people who have been moved by it and not feel anything. It's troubling. I mean, people, <laughs> one time somebody came to me and said, you all right? And I was like, and I wasn't all right, but it didn't have anything to do with the piece. I was just sitting there like, I don't feel anything. And everybody feels it, you know. Um, yeah, we're talking about the Usher thing. Too. Yeah, and so connected to the Undertaker thing is uh, my godmother was an usher. This is her mean Reese. And she, uh, you know, she had a really profound like impact on me, and I guess how I understand the world. I mean, I also love my mom, love my grandmother, but for whatever reason, my godmother just had a really big impact. She was a kindergarten teacher in Tupelo, Mississippi, you know. So she raised a whole bunch of people, and I guess because I was a godson, I was in the kindergarten early, you know, like really early. Um, but uh, she was an usher, and she was a Methodist. My grandmother was a Baptist. Mostly I went to church with my grandmother. But on rare occasions, my godmother would take me to church with her, which was a Methodist church. Like once she took me to see, and I didn't discover this until years later, it was uh, Mahalia Jackson came to Tupelo and sang. And I was like, at Howard, <laughs> really. And I called her up and said, I said, Miss Herbie, did you ever take me to church <laughs> with you once, son, and you sang? He said, yeah, when you were four years old, Mahalia Jackson came to town and sang. I remembered it. I didn't know who Mahalia Jackson was. I just knew that this thing that I was experiencing was a little different from what I heard. I knew it was related to what I heard every Sunday. But I mean, it's the first time I can remember having what I would call an aesthetic experience as opposed mm -hmm. to just experiencing something that's mm -hmm. good, like just being conscious, of like, okay, in the realm of things that are soda pop, this is something else. It's soda pop, but it's another kind of soda pop. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can identify soda pop, but I ain't never had no soda pop like this. Uh, at four, you know, and then vaguely remember, it always floated in the back of my head and I was in the library of Howard listening to records and I just, I'm, I don't know why I pulled the Mahalia Jackson record. I was just really troubled by it. And then when I called her, I don't think I was even consciously, because I like, nah, it couldn't be. Like, just nah, it couldn't be. As soon as I called, she said, oh, yeah, when you were four, I took you to see Mahalia Jackson. That's why you went to church with me that Sunday, because Mahalia Jackson was in Tupelo, but she was singing at my church. She's like, oh, okay. But the thing about Miss Herb Bean and the whole thing about the uh, ushers, and I think it's somewhat related to a kind of coolness that I'm describing in a relationship. You know, I'm actually feeling very weepy here now. It's strange. Because um, you're home, son. Ain't <laughs> 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 around in New York, get lectures no more. <laughs> you don't have to be cool. Um, but Miss Herb Bean, like, because the usher thing is so, you know, I like to say, like, black expressivity exists on this pole. And we're really familiar with one pole of it, one polarity. That's the, you know, speaking in tongue, surplus expressivity. We can't just put the ball in the hole. We got to do a three, 360 degree somersault through our leg, then we put the ball in the hole. You don't get no extra points for all that. You know what I mean? But nevertheless, we still persist in doing it. Okay. That's what most people associate with us. Like if you're an MC, a million words, you know, you can do it fast, you got so much dexterity. Um, but there's another extreme other pole, and if that's speaking in tongues, I call it holding your tongue. And it kind of elicits the same kind of force, but it's harder to name because so much is associated with not doing as opposed to doing. Doing less, you know, not more. Uh, but the ushers are exemplars of that. If you've ever seen that, the ushers in church, this is some kabuki shit. 
They had those white gloves on, the white clothes. When I was a kid, I thought they were nurses. And one of my oldest jokes is, I thought they were nurses, but they don't never stop nobody from falling out. You know. And they stand there, and they don't hardly talk. They have their hand signs. <laughs> it's like some, some spiritual air traffic control system. <laughs> you know? Mm. Uh, but it's really spooky when you're a kid and you're watching it. Because I used to be like Miss Herbeen. I mean, you know, when you little, I'm trying to talk to her because she always talked to me, but she would never talk to me when she was usher, right? Mm. So she would be doing her thing and then she would do this. Give me that eye. That's all it was a side eye. Like, you know, sit your ass down. I'm going to talk to you later. Like booking Like she wasn't so, it's like she was in that function. She could not be my godmother, but she was still giving me the side eye, you know, like real subtle. So I think in some ways my sort of proclivity towards, even though, People say I was. I'm. I'm a, I'm a minimalist. People say there's nothing minimalist <laughs> about this. I do think it actually is, though. Like for me, it's very. It's very controlled for me. And I think I don't know. Maybe it's, that starts with like trying to get Miss Herbie to talk to her and her not acknowledging me, you know, and just having to stare at her. I just stare at her in the church, like, what's she doing? Why is she doing it like that? You know. Cool. Um, but that whole thing of being the usher and holding your tongue and that kind of um, intensity, I think, that it produces. Um, I think it's bound up with a whole bunch of things. It's bound up with society's demand that we don't have no thoughts that they don't own, that they don't understand. A person coming in the room not saying anything will spook everybody, you know, in a, in a mixed context. It'll make people very uncomfortable. If you just go there and, you know, I've been to parties one or two black people there, and I was thinking about what I was thinking about, and it just completely unnerved the whole party, just because I was in my own head, you know, and I realized at a certain point, like, wow, man, everybody was like, you know, I was like some kind of title force moving through the shit, and just because I was thinking about some shit that happened to me on the way there, it wasn't, wasn't about the context or nothing. Um, you know, put them at ease, this is the demand, you know, even if you're not fucking thinking about them. When the sister says speaking to them, that's my thing is this address. I don't care who listens to it, who listens in, but I'm not talking to y'all. I'm speaking specifically to black folks. Um, that's my rule of thumb. Um, uh, last thing I guess just I would say is uh, somebody just said this at the uh, Carries thing. They said this, and I thought it, I was really <laughs> struck by the term. They say black people express in a tempo of emergency. Wow. And I, I was like, wow, that's such a deep, like, man, tempo of emergency. Like, so even improvisation, that's a formal strategy that's in the <laughs> tempo of emergency. Like, you, you, you know, the context is a shifting, moving, dynamic context. It's not fixed. It's not composed. Tempo of emergency demands that if you don't leap from here to there, you know how they had those things where the earth is coming apart and you get swallowed up in a hole like that. Yo, ain't no time to sit around and contemplate. Mm, what am I gonna do? Now, you know, and that's we're good at that operating at the tempo of emergency. Um, and I think like one of our survival strategies, everybody's familiar with this. I think it's like Cornell West has a great line where he says that things that we cannot not know as a black person in America, the things you cannot not know. But I think that not not knowing is something that we're doing. It's not like putting our hands in the ears. It's like, it's not passive sound. It's not passive resistance to knowing. It's an active resistance to knowing. It's more psychoanalytical. But everything works at a tempo. So to me, to a certain degree, I feel like with the film, I was very conscious. It's like there's a certain tempo at which the thing has to happen. And it's not even just fast, it's a speed, it's a tempo, it's a timing thing. Like there's a, you know that term, there's a term called saccades. I think it's saccades, something like that. In neurology, it's basically the pulse at which your brain processes the light that comes through your eyes, right? It's not continuous, actually, it's intermittent. There's a great science fiction novel called Blind Sight. And the alien species can see our neurological firing. Because of the way their nervous systems are built, they can move in between when our thing fires, which means it it means they're invisible. 
Like we can't see them because they just move. It's like if you blink, if you're blinking, they just move when our eyes are closed, but on a neurological level. Well, I do think like black folks, you know, this tempo of emergency, this not knowing part of it, it has a certain tempo and I feel like to a certain degree what I try to do is find the right cadence where it, it, go, it supersedes our mechanism for not knowing. I, this is me, I'm speculating now. But I think part of the effect of it is because it is getting around certain um, types of barriers we put up to not knowing. Because people would say, yeah, it's not just that it's one thing messed up or something else. Because I have another piece. Like Apex is actually faster. Because when I made Apex, it was like I used to tell people I wanted to go fast enough where you can't see the individual. You can see the individual images, but you can't dwell on them. But not so fast that you can't see them. And this is not nearly as fast as that, but I do think it's really about trying to be, it's like a double dutch, you know? That thing is at a certain tempo and you have to figure out what the tempo is where you can just move through, you know, it's double halo. So like no, um, yeah, when we, uh, we did the, 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 the talk, um, was it Thursday? No, last week. On Sunday. Gavin. On Sunday. Sunday, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, you didn't, you uh, you had to start about passing the ball and what that means in the culture. Oh. But you didn't complete the thought. You know, yeah, because I've gotten bored with those yeah. topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I think in terms of how that relates to the editing of the piece. Oh, yeah, very, the editing. Oh, I can, yeah, the editing thing, it's funny, it's the one thing I didn't mention here. Like, the whole idea is, like, if you say, Mark was saying it's not it's not who's in front or behind the cameras, the editing. Um, that just goes with our whole tendency tendency towards what I call immaterial invention. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, you know, and it's bound up with a whole bunch of real obviously concrete things. I'm gonna do a very quick movement through it. It's something like this Nam June Pake, the Godfather video art, here's a great quote. He says, the culture that's going to survive in the future is a culture you can carry around in your head. And I think if you look at black people, the Middle Passage is a profound demonstration of that because the places where we are expressively strong, culturally strong, are the places where we can carry the culture on our nervous systems. That means we're really strong music, dance, oratorical stuff, because those things are essentially immaterial. The places where we're not as strong, or relatively speaking, underdeveloped, are things that require material expression, meaning architecture, sculpture, even though we come from these incredible traditions, there's no contemporary, there's no modern art without African art, right? So nevertheless, even though we come from that, relatively speaking, you know, you would say those things are underdeveloped, right? Because you can't carry architecture on a slave ship can't carry sculpture on a slave ship. Except for Elizabeth Catley. <laughs> yeah, maybe Elizabeth Catley. But I mean, it's an anomaly. She's an anomaly. <laughs> you know? But in general, you can't do those things. And, and, and not just that, because even if you couldn't carry those things, arguably, if we got here and we had some leeway, we could recreate some version of those things. But when we get here, not only can we not c control raw material, we are raw material. Right? We're things when we get here. We're not, be, we're not people when we get here. We're things. So, um, what about the idea, I, AJ? Because I want to push back a little bit on that. But thinking about carrying design you know, in, 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 in our cerebral capacity so that when we actually do get access to actual material things. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not saying it's not there. No. I mean, even, in, in, even initially when, like, there's a, there was a, I feel like, I'm not good at this when I do these talks too. When I do them too many times, I feel like I repeat myself. It's like shtick, you know, I'm doing a shtick. But anyway, Cornell, like in the early 80s, the first time I ever read anything from Cornell West, it was this wide ranging essay. I can't even remember the journal was in, but he was talking about everything. I was always a brilliant cat. And then he got on the art and he was talking about the music and that very, you kinetic know. Kinetic orality, right? Huh? That, that thing he used to talk about, kinetic orality. I mean, you just so with so many concepts. Yeah. It was like a bunch of concepts at once from this one person. But when he got to music, and then the person, well, what about visual art? He said, as far as I can tell, it's not very apparent. And it set off a shitstorm, like in the black visual arts community, particularly like <laughs> Howard Dean and Piddell and all them went crazy. They went crazy. It was like, he's speaking out of ignorance. He's just speaking from what he don't know. 
And but Cornell said something I think was kind of on point. He said, look, the reason why black visual expressivity is underdeveloped is because it never found a home in the church because black churches were Protestant churches. And the Protestant religion to visuality versus Catholic relationship to visuality. I don't think it's an accident that Bosco's parents are Haitian and Puerto Rican. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it's arbitrary. I don't think like you go to Brazil, the flags, the condomble, all the visual stuff that goes with it, there's no equivalent of that in the black church. And he says, his argument was that the black church was the only institution we had. And where is it created an incubation space for the music, the dance, all those other things? It didn't do that for the visual thing because it's Protestant. Okay, now that's his argument. Now, anybody who grows up, <laughs> I think he got one thing wrong when he said black visual culture was not apparent. It's a misuse of words. It's not visual culture. It's pictorial culture was underdeveloped, not visual culture. Because visually, our shit is off the chain. So when you talk about the design right. shit right. in your head, that's, that's it. That's where it manifests itself in how we dress. The hats. <laughs> how we walk, how we move, and all this kind of stuff. And so the picture makers have been trying to catch up with the culture yeah. for so long anyway, right? Yeah. But it's like, it's the same thing, though. It's closer to our bodies, because that's all we control. It's closer to our bodies. The clothes we wear, how we stand in space, all this kind of stuff is profound visual uh, sophistication. But black pictorial, which demands material, I think, relatively underdeveloped relative number but it doesn't mean yard sculptures anybody who grew up in the south know people have crazy installations and shit in the yard all that's true but i do fit, and that's some profound i'm just saying that's some profound shit that's some profound shit you don't agree with that who don't agree with that the yard sculptures no i mean you know, the, the, the line of argument about uh, uh, our capacity to that material culture. I think the, they brought black architects and black uh, designers to build the places and so they got the wealth. Right. So they came with that knowledge. I mean, we're at Duke, right? Well, Abele did the West Campus, right? So, right, so right I, there. I think you have a point with popular culture. So when you start to talk about, you know, if you don't make black people excited about visual culture and design culture, it's not present in popular media. But the design is actually designed and built by black people because of knowledge. Well, of what? Them. But what I'm trying to say is not what we did. I'm talking about the relative state, state of in the culture. Meaning, you can talk about sports, you can talk about music and all this thing. I can mention, literally I think, 100 people in any of these arenas. And I challenge you to mention more than three architects to me, black architects. And don't start with David A.J. because he's British. Right? <laughs> yeah, start here. Okay, oh, we'll, take, we'll take the two of them out the mix because everybody in the world know them now, right? <laughs> That's one. That's one. Black architect, you in the belly with this campus, so we sit on it. Okay, that's, that's two. two. <laughs> 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 I got a couple hundred people to talk Right. No. I get your point, but in terms of popular culture, just No, I'm not. Culture. See, I don't. See, this is one thing, like, people point it out. I don't, to me, I know, like, intellectually, I know there's a difference between popular culture and whatever, but for me personally, I don't care about none of that. All I care about is the shit fresh. I don't care about, I don't have no high, low shit. I get that. But so for me, it's not like, oh, in the arena of popular culture, in the arena. No. Any motherfucker. Give me a name. I don't care <laughs> who it is. The church you went to was probably done by black. No, I'm not talking about properties. I'm not talking about properties. Because part of it, also to part of the thing in being underdeveloped is this, is that if you excel in it, you can make a living out of it. And if you can make a living out of it, your name is attached to your work. The fact that the shit is underdeveloped means you don't get credit for the shit you did that we have in this discussion. I'm not saying it's not... Geniuses, Max Barnes, I can mention five. Max Barnes is a genius, right? But I'm just was saying. R&D. Who? Was R&D. Yeah, that's true. Oh, that's true. There was a conversation, though, um, about uh, with regards to particularly religious representation, people who are emotionally saying nomads, for instance, they represent their relationship to spirituality in sonorous tones and localities versus people who are sedentary living in cities um, who represent the Stable stone structures and intellectual being in movement versus being stable. Well, I agree that, but I'm just, but I, but again, I think that still is that's that's mobile expressivity. 
you could call it mobile expressivity. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a there's a bunch of they would be called visionary or outsider artists and stuff who actually do draw. They actually draw. It's a rich tradition of that. But almost in every instance, those people will be considered religiously outliers. Most of them would be considered outliers religiously. They would be considered people who didn't function in the church as we normally understand it. And I think no, they, were, they were hoodoo practitioners. Hoodoo yeah, practitioners, yeah. and to a certain degree, work with a relationship the to, people who had whatever nature. that ancestral yeah. thing is that say, no, I'm going to make material expression of these experiences, they had to do it outside of the church. They couldn't do it in the church. I'm yeah. not, yeah. anyway, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. rambling. Let me take one more question. Anybody got anything else to add? <laughs> region? Right. I mean, like, I feel like he just, he sees things different. He than folks in other, other spaces. And I felt like. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Speaking for myself, me personally, I empathize with things differently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, sure, of course. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, that seems to me like so obvious. I mean, but maybe it's not. Maybe I have to say that. I mean, you know, it's funny. I was in this. Uh, I got invited to join this. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, Practice and Refusal Work Group at Alpha at Marner. It's like Sadia Hardman and Tina Camp are the co-chairs of it. You know, a bunch of really smart people sitting around the table for 12 hours a day talking about stuff. And yesterday, towards the end, it kind of, I don't want to say devolved, because that sounds like, you know, it was a downward move. It wasn't that. But we, where we landed was this place, and one of the questions that came up is like, do we have to be the same in order to have solidarity? Okay, to me that was the hardest way to say it. Like because one of the things that I was I was saying I was like, look, when I first went to London and they were calling Southeast Asian people black, that shit confused me. Like coming from Mississippi, I was like, I didn't. This shit confused the shit out of me, right? And we know like blackness is two things. It's an engendered state, and it is a category. They are, but those are not the same things. Those are two things that coexist. Black people are of African descent, but we're not the same as African people. People don't want to say it because it seems like we try not to be have solidarity with people. But the thing is, is at some point when black African people were brought here, something happened, which we could talk about, that transformed them into black people. When I first went to Africa, the biggest shock in my life was how few black people there were there. They were either Yoruba or Igbo. They were a whole bunch of shit, but it wasn't a whole lot of black. Yeah, you meet some people who say they were black, but it was clearly like they adopted it. And so, like, for example, there's the Dalit Panthers, people who adopted the Black Panthers as a model, the, uh, the uh, Sudra, the untouchables in India. They darken than black people, right? But the reason they adopted Panthers, like somebody had said in the group, like, Oh, it was a, they adopted the Panthers' political strategy. Sounds like, yo, let's be for real. No, they didn't just adopt their political strategies. What they adopted is something that black people do, which is this. And they said one of the things that's different about black people and how we experience or how slavery transformed us is we internalize the slavery. Like a lot of the people did not internalize slavery. They were just enslaved. But they didn't internalize slavery. We internalize it. I don't know if because we had to live with these motherfuckers. I don't know why. It's complicated. But we internalize the shit, and the consequences of internalizing it are things like this. When we start to resist it, we do things like, and I don't know that many other people do this in the face of, of the earth. Like, okay, they say, we are human, and you're not human. I call it discrepancy. If you have a culture and somebody says you're in a family, your mom and dad, and somebody said to you, you don't got no family, right? Yeah, of course I do. I know my mom and dad. You can put me in a box and I still know my mom and dad. That's not going to stop me. 
But after several generations, if you tell people they ain't got no family, they ain't got no culture, and they can't point to the culture that they have, at a certain point they're fr they flee free floating. It's in free fall in a certain kind of way, right? So when black people, African peoples are so many generations down are confronted with this system that's saying we're not human, right? Our first internal response to it is, yes, I am a human, but we don't have all the superstructure that culture gives us to say it. I mean, we're not embedded in the culture that lets us counter that, right? So it's something about the discrepancy between them saying you're not human and you knowing you are human, but it's coming like from inside of you as opposed to the superstructure. I think that's when black consciousness, to me, starts to happen. So well, that you can well, grow. Matt, but just Matt, let me say yeah, one yeah, last yeah, point, yeah. and then I'll shut up. <laughs> Such that we do things like, so if they say you're bad, right? I think we're some of the few people on the face of the earth say, yeah, we bad. We bad motherfuckers. Not only are we bad, we super bad. It's just something about that, which is not even just saying, no, you say I'm bad, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Like, nah, motherfucker, I'm bad. That is something about that. It's, it's got something to do with internalizing stuff in a weirdo kind of way. And that's, I think, part of our difference. And so when people say X, Y, and Z people are black, yeah, it's cool as a category and everything, but they're really not black because they don't think like that. They don't, it's a different way of thinking. And people admire it. Because there's some benefits to it, even though there's a lot of downsides to it, too, in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, the thing that's interesting to me is to look at, you look at 19th century black people who I like to say invented us and, you know, we're just bad knockoffs with better media, you know, because when you actually look at, you know, the people who emerged in that century, they had already established, they established their humanity in the face of, uh, you know, incredible dehumanization, incredible repression. So you have these remarkable people that emerge, you know, like a Frederick Douglass, you know, or Harry Tubman, but those are the people who become, you know, recognized as the superstars of that, of that time. But when you look at what black people in mass did when they got off the plantations, first thing people did was went and found their family. So it's like, that's, it's just like, well, I don't really even believe in the, the whole post-traumatic slavery syndrome, because it's like, we're more traumatized in many ways than the people who came off yeah. those plantations. Yeah, you know because, they, because, because, part, because part of because what of they, they did was they deferred it to us. That's why they could function no, the way they I think, did. No, I, th I, think, I think it was, you know, I think it was a recognition, you know, no, they, they came. They put that shit in the buffer, man. They put that shit in the buffer, and now we're dealing with the consequences. No, I think, I think, I think, contrary to your point, I think they didn't assimilate the notion that they weren't human. In fact, what they looked at was the people who were telling them they weren't human. They said, y'all motherfuckers are the monsters. You know, we're the humans based on your criteria, based on this religion you're trying to feed us. It's like, I mean, immediately people recognize, like, well, if you're saying this is what a Christian is, you're not that you must be the devil. You're the Pharaohs. You know, they're the yeah, Pharisees. You know, yeah. you know, but so, I mean, the, the culture, autumn, you know, is already kind of formulating around this radical sense of opposition, you know, to this other thing that's trying to assert its humanity, but which black folks recognize in holding their tongues in that moment um, is, is anything but civilization is, is in fact quite barbaric. And it's like, if you really want to start, continue to unpack the story, you realize like all these, 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 these people who were hijacked from Africa came from incredibly developed civilizations. They were kidnapped by barbarians. You know, and there was a point, you know, certainly there's a point over generations where there's a loss of continuity in terms of the knowledge that can be passed down. But that essential core of, of one's humanness in the face of the superstructure, you know, which is kind of desperately, anxiously, neurotically, you know, across centuries trying to assert um, it's it's uh, it's trying to, you know, assert the denial of your humanity is actually revealing itself as being. Quite, bereft. Quite the bereft. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do you factor into that, like, uh, Portense's uh, thesis that, in fact, the, you know, <laughs> you know the one I'm talking about, right? Yeah. She, Hortense Phyllis has this thesis where she basically says that 
The slave trade, as we understand it, was largely intramural. And it's something that people don't want to face. Meaning, I realized this when I went to Africa for the first time, I was like, yo, on a certain psychoanalytical level, it's really clear that when black people are angry at white people, we're basically kind of angry at ourselves, basically, because on a certain level, who you who you the most mad at? The person who bought you or the person who sold you? Particularly yeah. if the person who sold you is supposedly family. Well, Barack, you get to Africa, you realize that shit is true. Yeah. Well, Barack, Barack had a very Marxist reading on that, which was that it's uh, it was about a ruling class being sold out, you know, selling out a working class. Absolutely. Yeah. That's totally you know what I mean. When so, the so there's, all, queens, there's, there's already the sons and there's already a division. Of yeah, yeah, it was all, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know. I like those <laughs> posters too, but. They, <laughs> We love we love African pageantry. We claim it, you know. We claim it more than Africans claim it. You know what I mean? You know. But um, no, I mean it's psychologically, you, you know, it's like you can go certain places in, in Africa that were integral to the slave trade, and just see how complete the divorce from us is. You know, the rejection of us. I mean, it's it's like psychologically, it's still going on. We the return today. of the repressed. When we yeah. come around, they be like looking through us and shit, can, right? Can, can, can we get a whole temp response? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was like, I just, I just said, I have this, this, uh, this Ghanaian friend of mine, she has a, a cousin that, that does business with African Americans in, in Accra, you know, and she told me she had lunch with him one time and he, and he said, uh, ah, Said after our lunch, I had to go deal with the African Americans. They went to the castles today, you know. It's like when they come back from the castles, they're always so weepy. <laughs> you know, so it's like zero empathy <laughs> going on there in terms of your 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 badass blackness. You know I mean? Let me get on the, the last mother. word from Natalie. Okay. I just want to ask a quick question for my next question, but the question is about the Greek Oh please, <laughs> you just call us. Yeah. Real. <laughs> AJ, one of the things that struck me about the film is that it is all archival, right? It's, I mean, it's not. It's, it's not. not. It's the it's thing not. that I fight. That I fight everybody about this all the time. It's like forty percent of archival. Really? Yeah. When that's you see a, the kid jumping, that's my son. When you yeah. see the girl getting married, that's my daughter. But that's my mama. Them dancing. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> says it's, it's found footage all the time. And I just like. Okay. Yeah. Well, this. So, yeah. I think the question applies, which is, from what I know about all of your work, all three of you, the archives are very important. So on Black Future, what will the archives help us, or how will the archives help us, um, you know, to think about the themes of your work? I mean, the thing, is, the thing for me is that, and I think, you know, this piece epitomizes is that, um, um, like our, our archives are present, are current, they're contemporaneous, you know what I mean? It's like they're occurring now, you know, um, in terms of, uh, you know, this invaluable commentary on um, uh, who we've become in the next, or who we, we are in this instant, you know, who will be in the, in the next instant, you know what I mean? So, and I think that, that in some ways because, you know, um, the piece in roles like it's very in a very kind of biographical way, you know, um, AJ's family into um, you know these um, you know these these scenes of subjection as the DR would say in terror, you know, and also um, recovery recovery and exhilaration and so forth. Um, you're really talking about um, it's not like we don't have a museum relationship to the music, you know what I mean. Um, and um, you're only, in terms of your own uh, individual statement, I mean, it's only as valuable as the degree to which you, you extend the conversation into the future, you know what I mean? So it's a very different kind of relationship even to futurity. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I always talk about when, you know, I teach classes on Sun Ra and, and Delaney and Butler, it's like all of those people are, are they're embodied futurists. You know what I mean? Like they are, they are actually, if you just think about Sun Ra, Samuel Delaney, and Octavia Butler as just human beings, any, if, any three, if all three of them walked in the room, you know, you would just immediately feel like in the presence of otherness, an otherness within our otherness. You know what I mean? It's like the way they occupied space, the way 
they speak, you know, the way their minds actually kind of uh, uh, formulate thoughts and ideas, their relationship to sexuality, you know what I mean? In some ways, you know, what, you know, what Jay was saying just about, you know, the 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 the, the griots being the pariahs, on the sense, or the out the outsiders among the outsiders. It's true to all of them, and then you deal with the work itself. But I mean, the thing is, um, it's, you know, of course, nobody who's claimed as an Afrofuturist in terms of originating um, the discipline or the work ever called themselves that, you know what I mean? Because um, they were too busy, like, activating themselves in the present to speak on, um, uh, to, I mean, to create bodies of work that just gave us alternative visions, you know, of, of uh, but also critical visions of the way society was working, you know, to, to, uh, to kind of discombobulate and dissect and disintegrate, you know, black people's sense of wholeness as well, yeah. So, you know, so much of what I processed there, I've talked to somebody this with you, Natalie, um, and, and it speaks to what AJ was talking about earlier, right? I, I'm concerned with, you know, how do we carry the archive into the future, right? You know, this transition from the idea of the, an, the of the archive as analog to digital, um, and and even the idea of thinking about the archive as maroon, right? And not the archive of maroons, but the actual art black archive as being something that's maroon, that's maroon marinage. It's hidden in plain sight, right? If you think about our relationship, blackness is its relationship to YouTube. It is hidden in plain sight. Not everybody can find all the shit that's up in there, right? You have to have a certain kind of cultural DNA to find blackness in this um, immense <laughs> archive that's like YouTube now, right? What does that look like going forward? Who are going to be the folks unpacking black Twitter 35 years from now, and, and where is this huge amount of data? Where is it going to actually reside, right? Because at, even as you talk about this idea of us not, our, our relationship is not like a relationship to museums, you know, who has the capacity to maintain all of this data, yeah. right? Well, black, folk, black folks have never had, you know, access to, to, but that's, a to that's, right. a, that's a DJ. Right, <laughs> exactly, you know I mean? right. Yeah. It's, no, I, mean, I mean, that's what a conference is talking about, right? That's, I mean, right, so, yeah, yeah, right, I mean, right. To a certain kind of core, you know, 80s, 90s hip hop records, like second public enemy record, like might be 300 samples mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on one song. You know what I mean? But if you actually had an emotional relationship to that music, you understood why they made those choices. But they actually created like a new syntax, right. you know, right. new context, right. you know, new statement. You know, with with the, with you know with these uh, these mosaic bits. So it's you know. So I mean, the thing is like there's already a precedent within the culture about how for picking and choosing, right. Right. you know, the information that's going to advance the conversation. I mean, and, you know, it's just all about, you know, about having a, a spiritually dynamic relationship to, to the, the, the material of the immaterial. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like there's a difference between data and information. People mm -hmm. get them confused sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like you can, you can have some, you can have some, some uh, data on the drive, right? You take a photograph, let's say, for example. Well, you can compress a photograph. It can be like 40 gigs, one image, and you can compress it down to one gig and re-expand it, and you would say that image was deteriorated, right? Because when you throw away data, you can't get it back. I mean, you know, they have schemes to compress things and then uncompress them. But if I have a piece of paper and it says, go home when you read this, right? You can compress the shit out of that, right? Because it doesn't matter if you throw data away, because when you expand it after compressing, you can still have the information, even though you do that away, right? So it's something, I think a little of it's like that. Like me personally, I don't have archive fever. You know, the whole- It's obsessive. an archive fever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole obsessive, and that's a new boogaboo in academia, everybody's archives, right? As opposed to stuff. Big day, big day. Big day. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's our mass nice archive, because cause Derrida and all of them said it was archives, right? Like the thing is, even inside of the logic, which I don't accept of archives, even inside of the logic of archives, is YouTube footage of a person dash camp, is that archival footage? It never went anywhere to be put away that you had to dig it out. It was always in front of us. So I don't even know if that's properly speaking archival footage. If that's archival footage, then, well, what is not archival then? You know what I'm just saying? It but, becomes so ubiquitous, then but, but nothing it, is not archived. But, uh, but are we actually archiving things in a way that fundamentally transforms what the meaning 
of an archive is, right? I think could, a lot could, of what we could. do, like when you were basically, what you were starting to do, and you were talking about maroon archives and all this kind of stuff, that's what we do all the time. We start reworking a thing yes, yes, to yes, the yes, point yes, that yes, it's yes, not yes, even yes. a thing anymore. We just, we should rename it something else. I think it's, a lot of times, I think it would be better if we just name it a thing, you know, a stuff, or black stuff, or something. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm not just saying, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the term archives, but I do think a lot of times we're not sensitive to, that's a term that we've adopted, and we know if we want to be part of that discourse, we can use that term and all that kind of stuff. But basically, like Greg said, a better model is like what DJs do, and then you never, the way we're collecting data now, the way things are being recorded, there's never going to, maybe AI is in the future or something, there's never going to, it's so much information nobody can get through as it. As the archivist in the room, can I just say <laughs> that archives <laughs> has to be collected about the time that they were created. Because they're not going to be able to go back and find That's what I'm talking about. And how much stuff is not that? See, but I'm rejecting that as what. Uh, but that's not how people use right, archives right, right. now. Right. They're using it colloquially right. now, right? They got this layman's use of archive. It's anything that's recorded, they say is an archive. Just like th well, this is a curated panel, right? So it's not just three dudes on a panel, right? It's something that we, <laughs> we, we curated. What I'm just trying to say, what I'm trying to say is like, it's good. I'm so happy the sister's here to say precise. Oh my God. I'm not trying to take <laughs> No, there's always going to be a need for a archive. But I'm just trying to say, we use it casually, and it's so ubiquitous the way we're using it. That's what I'm saying. The dash cam footage is not appraised and collected and put in a... I mean, is YouTube maybe... But as a filmmaker, I mean, I'm, that's my frame of reference. Right. When I am making a film, and I need some, something that I didn't choose, and that is going to represent a certain time and space. I may not go to Tarantino to get that, but I, I could go to YouTube and there's stuff there. I agree, but I wouldn't necessarily call it an archive. I wouldn't call it an archive because like when I was growing up, when I was coming up in film, like in the uh, 80s, if they say you do a documentary and you have to get footage, I had never heard nobody use the term archive. At the time they would say, go to so-and-so's collection. There was all these other terms, mm -hmm. collection, or, you know, like they have the, like at the Schomburg, people would have their things that they kept, and when they died, somebody would gather them. Now, all of a sudden, it's an archive. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is an archive. I'm just, uh, it's not even about the term. I don't even care about the semantics of the term. I think we do this time and time again. We collapse a thing that exists as a real concrete thing in the world into a thing that may be a Venn diagram in some ways, it may overlap them, and then we adapt all these rules and regulations about the thing as it's totally supposed to be, and when our thing may be deficient in some ways in relationship to that, but maybe may be far superior, revolutionary by comparison. Mm -hmm. But that's why even the original thing, if you say, oh, like I see it's all archival, and that's why I said it, not to just say, it's like, yo, it's not, it's not. It's like all part of the thing has to be sutured together in a certain kind of way, and you want it to flow. So this is why I shoot this like that, or I shoot that like that, and the parts I pick and choose. But the picking and choosing part, and this is why there's always going to be a need for a quote-unquote archivist, because as I've worked with archivists a little bit now, meaning like I did a commercial for YouTube, say for example, and they hired three, uh, they call them researchers, and the researchers would then go to the archives and pull footage. I was really bored with the job I was doing, but it was really interesting to me, like if I put so-and-so, they would come back with the craziest shit, like almost free association from what I asked for. And I thought it was fascinating. So I just thought free associating words that I love. <laughs> I mean, they were getting paid. They, I was only using 2% of what they were coming back with anyway, right? It wasn't even that useful. But they, they, but they were a line item in the budget. So they were always there and they were, I just had friends doing it. So it didn't, I didn't go to produce it. I don't need them, this is unproductive. I'm just like, Miles Davis, uh, sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> No, and they would come back sometimes with some amazing stuff. I would never even kind of, I don't know what sort of algorithms they were using or something to process it. I don't know. 
And so I just started compiling stuff like that because I would never have access. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. But see, you know, see, Mark, you, you have an academic anxiety about being confronted with chaos theory. Right. Yeah. You know, no, see, see, artists welcome the opportunity <laughs> to, to freely embrace <laughs> chaos and uh, to find to find within that stew um, the things that actually speak to them. Right. You know, the thing is, you're never going to master, you know, the um, what's become what's going to become the the recorded. Right. Uh, home produced, citizen reported, produced um, record that, that uh, the digital technology right, affords, right, you know what I mean? Right. So, what about you know, compilation? There's a lot of good names, you know? Just a compilation of things to compile. Because I think at the end of the day, so much of it is going to be, to the degree these things can be magical, it's like a DJ. You know, everybody's experienced this. A great DJ, you give them the same 10 records as like 10 other DJs, and that makes them really incredible from those same finite 10 records. Because it's all in the mix. Because it's all in the mix. Yeah. And it's all in like where you drop the needle and where you take the needle up. Mm -hmm. It's just that. And mm -hmm. that's infinite. Yeah. That's infinite. It's never going to be like the best DJ is the person with 5 million records. It, it, it's just, it's no correlation. Yeah, I mean, sampling is just so much about like, you know, looking at the 70s uh, production of black music and saying, that record, that record exists for the, for those two bars right there. There's nothing else in here that we find even remotely useful in carrying on. You know, what I mean? and which is a nomadic approach to exactly. culture. It's disposing of the thing. Well, that, keep the information, yeah. but let go of all that unnecessary data. Yeah, the baggage. The baggage. Yeah. yeah. Arthur Jaffa, AJ, Greg Tate. <laughs>